I would fly to Singapore for a day. I would fly to India for a day. I wasn't doing all that for my family. I was doing because I was really good at it. I think this is the year that the no value interaction between buyer and seller is going to disappear, or at least the tolerance yeah. on it from the buyer's standpoint is going to disappear. The Grant Cardones and the Wolf of Wall Streets, Jordan Belfort's of the world, uh, it's everything that's wrong about selling, in my opinion. Influence people, but not manipulate people. And I think that's the line. I think it's an absolute travesty that we're putting these kids into that much debt to get these jobs, and they're not teaching them for what the real world is all about. I'd rather give her two to three hundred thousand dollars and help her start four or five companies, let them all fail miserably, and she will still be far better off coming out of four years than than if she went to university right now. And I think sales is the most transferable skill that you can get as well, because if you're interviewing, you're you're selling yourself. If you're trying to get promoted, you're selling your ideas, all that stuff. You wrote the book about this. But I don't read a lot, to be quite frank. I probably read five or six books in my life. I'd rather go make the mistake myself. I don't fundamentally understand why you would want to rely on somebody else for your success. That doesn't make any sense to me. If you're in sales, chances are you've heard his name, you know his work, and you've attended one of his seminars. My guest today is John Burroughs. There are several people in this season that I converse with about sales, since these are some of the brightest minds in sales in the world. And John is one of the people that I just had to talk about sales, especially because I am concerned about where the B2B sales is going in 2023 and the whole AI in sales shenanigan. So without further ado, John Burroughs on sales, AI, sales education for children and the personal growth. This is Growth Beyond Sales episode. Thank you for tuning in. I wanted to start off with your synopsis of how things are, because we are in the, the third quarter of 2021. Uh, you know, what shifts are happening in B2B sales right now? You know, where we are at right now? What's 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 going on? Yeah, <clears throat> oh, excuse me. Yeah, lots going on. Um, I don't think anybody knows uh, right now. I think this is the year of transition in general from a sales standpoint, because you know, I think we've always evolved uh, as a culture and yeah. as, you know, a profession with technology and leveraged it, whatever. Uh, quite frankly, what I saw with um, uh, ChatGPT when it came out really hit the scene kind of January. Yeah. It, was, it was, that to me is Pandora's box. I think that got opened up and I don't think we're going back. And so I think a lot of companies right now are trying to figure out what this transition looks like. Because quite frankly, uh, I've been talking about the death of the average sales rep for about, you know, since about 2017, when I started seeing artificial intelligence write emails and mm -hmm. do things. Um, and now it's commercialized. And so now yeah. anybody can do it. And so I think a lot of companies are struggling right now trying to figure out because what got us into this mess is not what's going to get us out of this mess, uh, especially in the tech and the SaaS space. I think we've over-engineered the sales process over the past 10 years in tech and and really tried and really lost sight of the fundamentals. And so now that sales is hard again and things have retracted and AI mm -hmm. is coming, there is a, I mean, I'm watching, I used to roll my eyes at personalization at scale, for instance, you know, I'd be like, oh, come on, you know, you have the outreaches and the sales loss of the world. I would just like, would you please stop it? Just by changing somebody's name, a title in an industry does it's not make not the personal. email personalized, yeah. right? Yeah. But now with some of the stuff I'm watching with, with some of these AI tools, like they're getting pretty damn close to true personalization at scale. And they're doing it far better than most sales reps are on the front end. So I think that's where the impact is going to have the most, uh, the biggest impact is front end sales process. But I think a lot of these tools are going to reshape what a sales rep looks like in the not so distant right. future. I, I saw the interview of your um, back in 2016 when you talked about AI replacing uh, sales uh, reps mm -hmm. back then. So it was like yeah. seven years, right? But yeah. I'm sure that back then it was like purely the you know, kind of theoretical distance future, whatever, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? And now we're at the now we're here at the stage where it, it is already there. It's yeah. already been done, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think that that was back when I saw like you know the one uh, AI tool that was really mind blowing to me, which and I thought it was going to take off because I was like, holy crap, like this is insane. But it didn't, it didn't take because I don't think the, the models were there yet, right? The, the true AI was really there yet, but now it's here. And now it's, and you know, now it's compounding on itself. Now it's learning on top of itself. And so the, the exponential ability of it to, to scale is going to be something yeah. I don't think any of us have ever seen. 
So the technology changes, evolves. I understand we have AI now. The game is a bit different. It it kind of hacked. Uh, but then I have also the feeling that this year is the time where the buyers change as well. So as, mm-hmm. as if like the game, uh, the B2B sales game is also just changing. Maybe it's because oh, yeah. it's a result of the recession. Can you speak to this as well? Like if you feel the same in terms of the buyers and their approach to well yeah i mean i think the no the, again i think this is the year that the no value interaction between buyer and seller is going to disappear or at least the tolerance yeah. on it from the buyer standpoint is going to disappear because when i can get more value out of uh you know engaging with a tool like chat than i can a sales rep in a conversation right. like why would i why would i have a conversation with a sales rep who all they're going to do is ask me generic band questions and then press play on their piece of shit demo. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I, I see yeah. no value in that in any way, shape or form. There's actually a study that Gartner just put out there not so long ago, probably about three or four months ago at this point, mm-hmm. where they averaged out B2B buyers and they took uh, boomers, uh, Gen Xers and millennials and they averaged them all out. And they said, and the, and the results were that 43% on average, 43% of B2B buyers mm-hmm. want a rep free experience. They do not want a sales rep involved in the sales process. And to me, that's terrifying, right? Because, because then, you know, Gen Z comes up and that, that's just right. going to get exponentially worse. And so that's the bad news. But the good news is, is that of those 43% that wanted a rep-free experience, mm-hmm. um, they had actually a 23% higher regret rate. So of those people that didn't want a sales rep involved, they regretted the purchase 23% of the time more, mm-hmm. which tells me there is value that sales reps bring to the sales process, but it's just not in what we've traditionally looked at for the past 10 years of blasting out template emails, making generic right. cold calls, bank questions, demos, discounts, all that crap. It's about really engaging and yeah. bringing value at the point where the client is ready to engage and actually flooding them with value on the front end so that all that kind of almost creates this I, you know, I believe sales reps right now need to be mini marketers. You yeah. have to, it's all about these impressions, right? That's why personal brand matters. That's why the social touches matter. That's why calls still matter. Mm-hmm. That's why emails and everything else, because we're trying to orchestrate this, this account-based approach, but really just making sure that every interaction from the email mm-hmm. that we send them to the retweet is a positive impression so that when they're ready to make that decision or ready to engage, that we're the ones they actually reach out to. Yeah. Especially now, since I've um, I received numerous reports and I've seen it in my sales team that sales cycle is twice longer than it was oh, yeah. the last year, right? So yep. when you had a sales uh, journey taking three, 30, 60 days and you're like, mm-hmm. okay, I can make one, two, five, whatever, nine touches, right? So now mm-hmm. when it's extended to 60 to 90 or to half of the year, right? Now you're looking at what other meaningful engagements I can make. Yep. right to kind of to pro to to nurture that relationship mm-hmm. right and just purely off follow-up emails or calls it, it's not enough so now you have as you said like account based omni-channel sort of like kind of brand building thing right with all those online reviews and everything else like that's what ai is going to be able to pick up on right and so we're going to be able to do vendor searching I, my big fear with with ai isn't necessarily that it's going to place replace sales reps my big fear is it's actually going to start buying stuff And when AI starts buying stuff, when there's not a human on the other end who's actually purchasing the solution, that's when I think we're all in a lot of trouble. And that functionality is here already. Like there's no question that, I mean, the tools are there right now, for instance, to have an AI bot crawl your entire network infrastructure, look at the software, figure out the overlaps, tie Mm -hmm. it to your 12 to 20 month growth plan, go find and write an RFP to the top three vendors on G2 or Forrester or whatever. And then extract that information like that's already possible. So when that starts to become mainstream, that's when I think sales reps are going to have a really hard time figuring out how to sell in that environment. No, oh, well, that's actually a, a good point. Hmm. It's just when you think about, you know, how the SEO works and digital marketing, everything already structured. So everything is already figured out. We specifically build our websites to be read cleanly about what the offer is mm-hmm. for our clients are, what industry with services, and then you know, the higher you rank on Google, the better you're doing the job optimizing, right? So in main, yep. like if you optimize your digital profile in a way, then you get the business, right? And we all, yep. it's already the mechanic is there. Yeah, it's exactly. just we are ranking. But yep. if 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 you're ranking, someone is, you know, buying you from that ranking, then that's a... Huh. Yeah, tie that to the Gartner Magic quadrant and, quadrant and G2 reviews. Yeah. 
I'm so happy I invested in marketing early in the day and continue investing that, you know. (laughs) Yeah. I've uh, spoken with uh, with uh, Jared Robin on this topic from Rev Genius, and he mm-hmm. mentioned an interesting concept of collaborative sale, where you mm-hmm. kind of collaborate with other to actually make a sale. Because right now there's so many buyers and so many, so the buyer has so many options out there, right. and it's like when you shop out for, you know, shop around for the engagement tool, like you have right. Outreach, Sales Loft, uh, you know, Mailshake, you, you name yeah. it. So you have so many of those, and you're like. Why? How they're different? Like Apollo's introduced the the feature of engagements, right? Right. And you're like, so now you as a buyer are confused. So you you know, you are looking for a relationship or for collaboration with someone that can do. Hey, you should go ahead and a rec- rec- referral or something, right? Mm-hmm. And obviously, we can get a referral or kind of a referral if you have a community, if you have a brand, and when you are kind of a a marketer yourself. And mm-hmm. it goes me to the to the next mm-hmm. point. I've heard you you, you saying this. You, you, you said that we're going back to the full cycle sales. Mm-hmm. What do you mean by that? Yeah, I just think, look, predictable revenue, the model that Salesforce really stamped and, and uh, you know, Aaron Ross wrote a book about, um, you know, that changed the game uh, for SaaS sales. And it was, it was kind of that next evolution of the sales org and the restructuring of it, right? Because historically, it's always been full cycle sales for the most part, right? where everybody has to find their own business, whether it's an inbound or an outbound, and then bring it through the entire sales process. And then predictable revenue segmented those roles, right? So it was the first role was inbound, you, those SDRs take that. And then there's outbound BDR side that just sets up meetings and then the AE that takes it from there. And then you flip it over to the CS. Um, that's great from an organizational standpoint for us to scale because theoretically, right. you bring in you know cheap talent, basically, you know kids right out of school, you beat the crap out of them as SDRs and they grow up to be your full cycle sales reps, AEs. And it allows for special, specialization, which works, but it's, it's a terrible experience from a customer standpoint. Like nobody likes to be handed off two or three times before they actually talk to somebody that knows what they're talking about. And in today's world, Mm -hmm. when you have that engagement where somebody actually does say, wow, that's actually interesting, you know, whatever you just said there, whatever you just, you know, mentioned is something I'm interested. Let me tell me more. If we now have to stop the sales process because that resource can't give detailed information about what's going on or, you know, any type of value uh, proposition, then you're you're most likely going to lose that opportunity to make that impression on the client. And the longer you have to wait between the engagement to the next step, the less likely that next step is is to happen. And so I think we're moving to the point where, look, at, at the end of the day right now, if, you know, I actually think that our inboxes in the next six to 12 months are just going to be filled with actually super relevant and highly targeted uh, and personalized emails. Going back to, I think AI can do this now at scale. And, it, and ultimately, do I care? Whether it's a sales rep, if I get an email in my inbox, do I care that it's coming from an actual person or not? I don't. I mean, the reason that we hate spam, right, is is because it's mostly irrelevant. That's why we're like, oh, get all right. the spam out of my inbox. But if you think of like Instagram, for instance, like why do I like Instagram? Well, I like Instagram because I've trained that algorithm or that algorithm's trained me, whichever way you want to look at it. And I've, you know, I've thumbs up, thumbs down the ads. Yeah. I've said, I've stayed on certain things. So now almost every ad that I get on Instagram is actually super relevant and something yeah. cool, right? I'm like, oh, I didn't even know that was a thing. Let me get that, right? So if we take that and we apply that to the B2B world, there's there's enough information about most of us out there, right? Between our right. LinkedIn profiles and our social stuff and everything else for AI to pick up on that stuff and start tying it to solutions with intent data and everything else to start funneling real thoughtful, personalized stuff. So again, I don't that I, right. I don't care whether that is in my inbox and it's a person or not. Now, do I want to talk to somebody? Absolutely. I want to talk to a person. I don't want to talk to an AI bot. So that's why I think a lot of that mm-hmm. front end stuff, I think SDRs and BDRs are moving under, and I'm not thinking I'm watching it. Most SDR and BDR orgs that I'm working with right now are rolling up under marketing. And they're becoming more of a marketing slash op position where they are looking at all the data and they're re- looking for intent and they're engaged with a true ABM model to then fill the, the full cycle rep with not just like, hey, John, you should, uh, here's a list of names you should call today. But it's like, no, 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 John, you actually need to call Michael today because he just did these things. This is what happened. Oh, and by the way, you should call him instead of emailing him because he actually likes phone better based on his social profile and these type of things. And so now, and, and here's three snippets of information you should mention when you make that phone call, right? So now I am massively empowered with all the intel that I need to make a super highly relevant personalized call or email to you. And then if you respond, I can then take it and go full cycle with you, right? 
Mm -hmm. is also, and I'll add one more piece to this, is also you watching the trend of product lifestyle growth, you know, PLG motion with yeah. the most companies right now in the VC, the VC space um, are investing in PLG, product, product led growth companies, uh -huh. right? Yeah. Which is all about just getting it in the hands of the users, letting them right. actually use the full product, not the freemium version of it, and then meeting them where they are to, to help educate them, right? So going back to more of a customer service type role. So again, full cycle sales has to have deep knowledge of the sale, not deep knowledge, but knowledge enough of the product to be able to guide somebody through it and, and bring them through the entire sales process. So that's why I think we're, we're I don't think, I, again, I, I'm watching it happen, right? So it's, it's, it's inevitable to me that, that we're moving back to that kind of dashboard view of one rep who has all the intel and can make super targeted mega calls and emails. Um, how, how it's going to affect the traditional roles of SDR and SC? Yeah. I mean, I think they're going to turn into salaried positions, roll up into marketing and operations. And I don't know whether they're actually going to be the feeder system, right? Because again, mm -hmm. let's go back to the predictable revenue model. The model made sense when when they, when you could hire inexpensive reps and they right. became your AEs, mm -hmm. they're not doing that anymore. I think I, I forget the stats, but I, I think the average SDR stays in their company. Forget about their role. Like they stay in their company for like nine or 10 months or something like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So an organization hires some, some kids, right, out of school and they trains them, right? And with the idea that, okay, cool, they're going to grow up to be full cycle sales reps. Well, if they bail after nine or 10 months, that model is, is actually disaster. It's massively unprofitable yeah. for an organization if you actually look yeah. at it and, and you, don't, you don't pile in that longer term play there. It is massively unprofitable to pay a kid $100,000, you know, OTE, if you will, mm -hmm. and have them not, you know, and having get them four or five, six meetings that barely convert in a year, mm -hmm. you know, you know, a month over yeah. years. It just doesn't so make any sense. what is going to mean for the SE or AE? So they would need to learn how to uh, work to acquire and build their own pipeline, or it just doesn't mean it, it, they still going to be focusing on the closing and account management, but they would just rely more heavily on sort of like marketing acquisition for supplying them with, with leads. Yeah, I mean, look, I think they're going to have, I, first of all, I don't understand any AE out there that doesn't self-source their own business. I, you know, I, I say all the time, if, if there was an AE, if I was working in an organization right now and an AE came into me and I was their manager and, the re, and they told me that the reason that they didn't hit their quarter target or, you know, monthly target was because their SDR or marketing didn't give them enough leads. Before that phrase got out, before that sentence got out of their mouth, I'd probably fire them and tell them to get out of my office. Because I just don't, I don't fundamentally understand why you would want to rely on somebody else for your success. That doesn't make any sense to me. And so, yeah, they're going to have to figure out how to self-source their own stuff. But I think it's going to be mostly augmented by a lot of AI, a lot of insight, a lot of true intent. So that's not, you know, we got to take the mentality of the smile and dial cold call and blasting out emails out of the equation here. That's not what prospecting is, nor do I think it ever was. I think that's more marketing than anything else. Those templated generic cadences and all that stuff. To me, that's marketing. They, they, they could have done that better than we could anyways, right? Now with AI, they could do a thousand times better. Yeah. But do I think a sales rep needs to be very thoughtful as far as mm -hmm. who they go after and why they go after them with that information? Absolutely. Um, how the shift will affect businesses uh, at the same time? Because like I understand, okay, so the roles will change. Mm -hmm. That should potentially affect the scalability or the time for the rep to build up the pipeline, maybe. I don't mm -hmm. know, but for the business, what the, what is going to do for me? I, I think it's going to actually help us be a lot more profitable and a lot more efficient mm -hmm. and a lot more insight because, again, now you can fire up an outbound engine far faster and better than you could by hiring a whole host of SDRs and putting mm -hmm. them and going through training and then investing in uh -huh. a cadence tool and all that other stuff and then letting marketing manage it and everything else. So I think now with some, some little bit of effort up front, uh, I, you know, I think this whole AI revolution in general is going to make it so that you and I are going to first see the first, you know, three to five person billion dollar company. You know what I mean? Because if you think of venture yeah. capitalists, right? Usually you have to drop 50 G's into a company so that they can build out a go-to-market team. They can build out an engineering team and they can do all these things. Now you don't really have to for either one of those. I mean, there's some stuff that I'm seeing with, with some of the tools out there that I'm playing with that if you do the right job, if you set up your right ideal customer profile, you know, the personas that you're going after, and then you give this, you know, some of these tools, the value propositions of the value you bring, it's finding, engaging and writing those emails and putting them into say, so 
I would, you know, I would start with that if I was a new organization. I would start by getting that stuff tight and then turning that on to start going out to our addressable market and testing messaging and everything else. And so I think it's actually going to be great uh, because it's, it's, well, it's going to be great for uh, companies. It's probably going to be terrible for employees, right? Because this is just like McDonald's. If you look at McDonald's, you know, they, they've already automated, I, you know, they're rolling out fully automated stores and we're on that track period. I mean, I walk into Home Depot and Lowe's and they don't even have regular registers open anymore. Right. And so it, it's, it's just the inevitable piece of where we're headed to. And so unfortunately, you know, greedy corporations are going to use this to squeeze out, re- you know, individuals because they don't want to pay them and they're going to optimize it with, with technology. But what it means is that the reps who do evolve and learn how to use yeah. this stuff and engage with this stuff are going to be indispensable. Yeah. I mean, and they're going to be more, they're going to be making, you know, sick, high six figures and sort yeah. of like just enjoying it. And, but then obviously you need to also expand on your skill set, right? Because sure. it's not just about demos and presentation oh, God, and no. sort of like, no. Right, like sales enablement. It's all, it's just the well rounded more approach. So, well, and again, think about it like demos. I will tell you right now, I, demos are my least favorite part of the entire sales process because most sales reps press play on their demo. They do a mm-hmm. bunch of, they do a little bit of discovery. They ask some basic questions and then mm-hmm. they hard cut to their presentation and then they drone through it and pause going, oh, does that make sense? You know, and pause right. immediately, right? And and to me, that again, that there's no, that there's that's not a value to a, to yeah. a client. I, AI can do that better. So again, we have to reshape how we add value to this. And, mm-hmm. you know, I, I think it comes back to the consultative sale, asking, being genuinely curious, having some business acumen, mm-hmm. you know, having some true empathy for the client, understanding mm-hmm. what the situation they're in, but also engaging them with them when and where they want to be engaged with, mm-hmm. right? Because it's, it's funny to me always, it's always been funny to me that sales, we have this really beautiful linear sales process, right? We go from qualification to discovery and then discovery to presentation. And that's not how the client actually acts. Like there's no buying process as it relates to our selling process. They come in and out whenever they feel like it. They research stuff. They disappear for a while. They re-engage. Like I just got one this morning, for instance, right before our call here. I've been working this guy forever. And he told me a while ago, we got to do this immediately. You know, John, there's a short term here. And so I was like, okay, great. And I put this all stuff together and I understood the impact and everything else. And then puff, he disappeared. And I was like, God, you know, so, all right. So I then went to nurture mode and trying to add yeah. value. And, you know, three months later, I, I ping him on Friday with a, hey, just not touching base and checking in, but hey, been keeping myself updated. Notice you guys just did, did this, you know, any chance to re-engage. He's like, you know what? Your ears must've been ringing, John. I'm having a meeting tomorrow with my VP of enablement. We're ready to move forward. And today he said, send me over a proposal. So it, th- th- that was nowhere near a linear sales process. You know what I mean? Like they no. came in and out about three or four times and showed urgency immediately. I knew impact and then disappeared. And, you know, so I think it's just a, uh, a consistency, uh, professionalism, uh, like I said, curiosity, empathy, mm-hmm. all those type of things that humans can actually do better now because that's the question the ultimate question i think we all need to ask ourselves is you know what can we do that a computer can't because if a computer can do it you you just got to ask yourself like how much longer are they going to pay me to do this and so yeah Hmm. i've uh i've talked with dale dupree about uh, this and uh you know we obviously agreed on the fact that um, you know, it's not about logging in tasks and, and do the follow-ups in the sales, right? It's about putting intent and to mm-hmm. uh, an intention into the follow-ups, into what exactly I'm doing with this action and where yeah. it's going to lead me, right? If I need to pause, I'm pausing. If I need a relationship, I'm building a relationship. And I think that in tax specifically, we were highly relied on the scalability of the model. As you said, mm-hmm. like we need an SDR, we need a SC, we need to add 50 to 60 deals in a pipeline. We need to have the... Uh, you know, the serum process uh, written down and people following it with the templatized follow-up documents, uh, mm-hmm. check-in actions, et cetera, et cetera. And it's repeatable, 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 right? And mm-hmm. what's interesting in, with, with this recession where you kind of are, you don't understand buyers anymore, right? Because yeah. things are so different. It's like we're in the summer kind of, so usually the summer is a slow period of right. time, but at right. the same time kind of, is it the actual summer that was last year? It's a new summer, right? And then, so now what I'm seeing is the most successful SEs in my team are the ones that are, have, as you said, like, you know, business acumen uh, that sort of like are in a way some individualists that can kind of adapt, are flexible, are agile, yeah, yeah. and they kind of are 
not following the script and sometimes they are more they have more courage to kind of break something to be able mm-hmm. to show yep. the, um, that there is a kind of innovation in the process and, and win the business. So not being linear, right? Yeah. I mean, I think that, look, there's a big difference in my opinion between structure and scripts. Mm-hmm. I think we need structure. We can't have every rep doing anything that they want and not following any processes, process right. at all, right? Mm-hmm. But what I don't want to do is give them such a linear process that they have to like, oh, here's the script, here's the template. Because we are in a world right now too where, look, I, you know, I'm a Gen Xer here, right? So, so when I grew up, my, you know, my, and if I was bored in the house, for instance, my mom would kick me out of the house and say, just get, you know, go play, do something. I don't care what you do. Just don't kill anybody. Don't break anything, you know, come back by dinner, right? And so I would go and I would break things. I would burn things down, whatever. And I would, I would kind of figure things out. And now we're in a world where, and, and I see this because of my daughter, right? She's 12. Every minute of every kid's life right now is structured, right? They go from school to this hour to this hour. Then they have soccer practice from this hour to this hour. Then they have their iPad for 30 minutes. Then they have to, you know, dinner. And then they have you know, homework for two hours. And here in the States, especially, we, we teach the kids to the test, right? So it's now the MCAS test. It's forget about right. critical thinking. Like you need to memorize this thing so you can get the best score on your test so you can get into college. So now you take a kid who's been structured their entire life and taught to the test and you put them into the real world and you get somebody like me saying, hey, figure it out. And they look at you sideways like, what are you talking about? Figure it out. Tell me what to do. Mm-hmm. And the unfortunate reaction for most people in my position who have been there, done that, like, is, oh, you don't know what to do? All right, let me tell you exactly what to do. Here's a template. Here's a script. Go. And you give a kid a template or a script who's been taught to the test their entire life and structured their entire life. They will send, put send on the template. They will, they will read the script. But if you give them structure, right? Because like for me, you put structure on me and I break it. I'm like, ah, there's got to be a better way of doing this. I don't like being in structure, right? But I love building structure. Whereas the younger generation, they, they need the structure to excel in. And so I think that's where we can work together is by providing guardrails and structure so that they can figure things out and break it within that structure but still adhere to some guidelines so that we can learn from it, right? And that's where I think we can win because, the, mm-hmm. because this generation coming in, they'll, they'll um, excel within structure better than I ever would, yeah. right? But we got to figure out a way to put it, put some structure in place so that they can excel within that. It's actually one of the topics I wanted to talk with you today uh, is the, the education or the educating kids on the foundation of, of sales and yep. changing the perspective, right? Because I've, I've heard multiple times you talking that um, there is a certain perception that salespeople uh, get no respect these days. Yeah. And then it, and there's no kind of formal education of sort of like what the salespeople, you know, are, what they do, mm-hmm. what actual, you know, value create. And, you know, you, you wrote the book about this. So I wanted to yeah. kind of touch base first. Obviously, so first, not the book. First, I wanted yep. to understand the. You, you obviously did the research, and you, as you said, you have a twelve, a twelve year old. Mm-hmm. Um, what is you know what are what's going on with the educational system in terms of introducing sales to kids where we are at? Yeah, it's actually encouraging because now, I mean, when I graduated back in ninety eight, um, there was no education of sales. There was no there was no masters or undergrad or any of that stuff. And so, I mean, there was a couple of certification courses that you could take maybe at a local university after hours or something from somebody like me who would come in and just pro bono help out. But there was no like formal education. Now, I think there's about a hundred colleges in the United States that you can actually get your formal degree in sales, uh, sales um, for. And, um, and there's great sales organizations that I work with. Um, you know, there's a couple, um, a good friend of mine, Dr. Howard Dover down at UC Dallas. Um, he's killing it down there. And they have this, this sales uh, academy where they actually do, they compete with other schools throughout the year and they all come together about pitches and all this other stuff. And it's actually, I mean, I've, I've sat in and, and role played with some of these kids and they're better than, better than 90% of the sales reps I engage with for crying out loud. I'm like, whoa, I'm like, I'd hire you right now. So I think there is some encouragement. The problem is, is that it has such a negative perception that so many people don't even consider it as a profession to go into. It's still, by and large, the default profession, right? Most kids go into school and and they get their degree in whatever they think they want to be when they grow up, which I still think is asinine to ask an 18-year-old kid. 
Um, and so they dedicate four years in, to, into whatever it is. And then they graduate and they realize that either, oh, I don't want to do this. Or B, I can't make enough money doing this, sure. right? So, hey, I'm pretty good with people. I heard you can make some money in sales and, and they get into it. And the problem with that is their entree into sales, unless they really pick a good company with a solid sales training and, and you know, curriculum, mm -hmm. if you will, is right. they're usually thrown to the wolf. They're usually say, all right, here's your territory. You know, go ahead, start making something. Here's a script, here's a territory start. And most of them get out after a year because they're like, screw this, this is brutal, mm -hmm. right? And so they fall out and they go back into other things when I think they could be really successful if brought on the right way. So what I'm trying to do is change the perception all the way from a root level. So you, you mentioned a book that, um, that, uh, that I wrote and it's a children's book and, and it's yeah. called, I want to be in sales when I grow up. And the whole concept there is to introduce it to kids as an actual profession so that they could see themselves. Cause when you ask a kid, you know, you know, what do you want to be? And they, they, they know what a lawyer looks like because they see it on TV. They know what a police officer looks like. They know what an astronaut is, right? So it's easy for them to describe what they want to be because they can see it. When you, when, when you tell your kid, you know, in my situation, like if you tell your kid you're in sales, they kind of look at you sideways like, well, what do, what, do you, what do you mean, daddy? Like, what do you do all day long? Do you just talk to people all day long? And I'm like, well, <laughs> I mean, kind of, but, you know, let me explain it to you. And so when, if they can see it as a real profession, I think this is, I think it's, look, it's, sales is one of the most financially um, independent careers you could ever get into, uh, mm -hmm. most financially flexible. Also, it is, I don't want to say recession proof, but if your industry gets destroyed by artificial intelligence or something like that, if you have the ability to sell, you can go sell something else. Right. And I think sales is the most transferable skill that you can get as well, because if you're interviewing, you're, you're selling yourself. If you're trying to get promoted, you're selling your ideas, all that stuff. So all these skills can be applied. And so I want to give people the option, for instance, of going out and, and getting out of high school here in the States. And instead of, you know, going into two to $300,000 worth of debt uh, to get a $40,000 a year job that you're not going to probably like, well, before you, I, because I personally think our, our education system is a joke right now. I think it's an absolute travesty that we're putting these kids into that much debt to get these jobs and they're not teaching them for what the real world is all about, right? I'd rather, for me, frankly, I'd rather give my my daughter out of high school. I'd rather give her two to three hundred thousand dollars and help her start four or five companies. Let them all fail miserably, and she will still be far better off coming out of four years than than if she went to university right now. And that's why I think sales could give reps uh, people an option where they can go make a few bucks before they get into college, see what the real world is all about, pay their bills, and then decide. Hey, you know what? I think I do want to go to school for this thing, right? Because that's why I like MBAs, for instance. I think I think yeah. I think undergrad is uh, is a social education. I don't think it's an actual education. I think it's a it's a really good social education for mm -hmm. kids. But to spend three hundred grand on a social, education, social education, I'm good, right? right? Um, where MBAs, that's I think where you get your real education. Because for the mm -hmm. most part, you're de you you're deciding what you want to be oh, yeah. educated on. You're like, I want to go learn this thing. So now you're much more in tune to learning it. And that's why I think if we give them a bridge year of a gap or a year or two before college and let them go sell and make some money, mm -hmm. well, now they can cho choose what they want to do. And, and then they'll be what, much more open to learning it. If we talk more about the book, can you mm -hmm. um, explain the concept? And again, I'm interested to learn the concept of the book. Yeah. I actually bought it and it's actually okay. being delivered just now. Uh, yeah. But because I, I, I have a nephew and uh, I saw that the book is for the kids between six to eight and yeah, it's a, it's a storytelling, I, I mm -hmm. guess. So, and I really wanted to, uh, you know, to have that book with my nephew and sort of mm -hmm. we can work on that and then kind of, you know, and educate yeah. together. First off, who inspired you? You know, yeah. why you decided to, to wrote, I want to be in sales when I grow up the way you wrote it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, my daughter did in general, but I, you know, it was one of those things where um, everybody was always asking me, John, when are you going to write a book? And, you know, and I don't read a lot, to be quite frank. Like, I just, I, you know, I probably read five or six books in my life. I, you know, I, I kind of drank my way through four years of college. So I always felt like I'd be a little bit of a hypocrite to write a book, right? And, yeah. I, and I never want to do things just to do them. And so this was an opportunity where when my daughter was about five or six years old, you know, I was traveling all over the place. And again, to, tr to she didn't really understood what I did. So mm -hmm. I was trying to figure out a way to connect with her a little bit more and help her understand what I did. And she had come to me when, uh, when she, she joined Girl Scouts. Um, and she had come to me and, you know, you sell Girl Scout cookies here. And, and that's a big thing to drive money for your troop. 
And she came to me and she said, Daddy, I have a link here that um, that people can buy Girl Scout cookies from me online if they, you know, because traditionally Girl Scout cookies, you go door to door, you sell them or, you know, to your network, that type of thing. But now they can sell them online. And she said, could you, I know you have a really large social media following. Could you, you know, share it on your social? And I was like, no, absolutely not. And she's like, well, why not? I was like, first of all, that's my network. And I work my ass off to get it. And second of all, why would they buy for you from you over any other kid that's trying to sell them Girl Scout cookies right now, right? And she's like, well, what do I need to do? I was like, well, you need to come up with your pitch. Like, why, why would they buy from you? And so we did this little video where she, you know, given her pitch of why, you know, buy her Girl Scout cookies and which her favorite ones were. And she was a little nervous about it. So she puts in mm-hmm. this big wig and she comes up with her pitch and we put it together and it was cute. And so I wrote a little blog post on it, right? And, uh, and it did really well. And a bunch of people bought Girl Scouts. She was the highest, you know, in, their, in her town by far. And then year two came to me again. And I said, all right, well, we got to level up this time. Now we're going door to door. And so we did a video of like objection handling and door to door selling and everything else. And, you know, did another blog post on it and it took off and did well again. And after that, I was like, you know what, this, I think this is a fun learning story uh, that, that can really walk people through the fundamentals of sales in a, in a fun way. And because there were so many learning lessons about timing, about the right fit, about your audience and what they need versus what you think they need and, you know, and how it's not all about making money and everything else. So it was a really cool project to, to, you know, work on with mm-hmm. her, um, that, that helped me connect with her a lot more, helped her understand what I did and also, uh, tried to introduce it to kids because not only am I trying to elevate the profession, but I'm also, trying to get more women in, into sales because I think women are yeah. some of the best sales professionals I've ever yeah. seen in my life. And so getting more of them introduced to it early age and also 100% of the char- uh, profits go to charity. So that was another thing. My daughter actually does not want to be in sales when she grows up. Uh, she wants to be a veterinarian. And so yeah. uh, so we donate about $25,000 a year to the um, World Wildlife Fund. So that makes it pretty special as well. If she's going to be in veterinarian, she's still going to be a sales in sales, oh, right? Yeah, because no, you need always to... Yep. sell you know yep. she, she would either she gonna open up her own shop and they yep. would need to sell to a new people you yep. know to product to partners yep. to doggies and caddies with uh, some gifties mm-hmm. etc right that's just the the, the way it is exactly. um do did you get any feedback from kids i wanted to do have, yeah. have you had any feedback from customers what did they say did they like yeah. the story did they They absolutely, I mean, that's probably my favorite feedback that I get. You know, when I get the email from somebody who bought it and read it to their kid and their kid's now out doing a lemonade stand and learning about profit versus revenue and, Mm -hmm. you know, all these other things. um, Those are some of the best emails and and pieces of feed or posts that I see. I have a whole folder of of responses from people saying, thank you. You know, this helps, this helped my kid understand what I did more. And this was a great read at night. This has become their favorite book, right? So it's, it's been super rewarding. My dad had a a pop and mom shop, sort of like um, selling souvenirs. Um, and every summer, since I was like six, seven years old, I went there and I worked for him. Mm. And every every summer, I could make money, and then I can buy clothes. I can buy my first iPhone from those money. So I could make you know I I, I could make money as I was growing up. Mm-hmm. And from the you know from the early age, I learned you know, what is the cost of a product, how they manufacture, how you work with manufacturers, cool. how you kind of pay them, uh, yeah. how you barter up, how you make profits, how you calculate those. And even in the age of like 13 or 14, I even hired my first resellers and et cetera. And I just know that that was something that helped me to never have a formal business education. So mm. when I went in tech, started working in tech, I always approach problems and companies as they, an owner of the business, not as the hired employee that I'm in sales, but rather yep. like how this actually product works, how it's manufactured, and then how I can apply this product with the problem it solves to my customers and always, you know, talk. So even if I was like 18, 90, 20 years old, I always talk as if I understand the business and have mm-hmm. that acumen. And I basically didn't learn it because I learned it from the father growing up, right? So I think yeah. that it's very um, rewarding and it's very important to have and, you know, educate kids on some on some complex topics like sales and entrepreneurship and, uh, you know, just generally creating things from nothing that you, you didn't have that. And now you have something, right? Creating value and value creation in general. Absolutely. So, you know, you're doing a great thing there. 
Yeah, thanks. I'm and trying. I look we'll forward to we'll seeing more of the books. You know, if you're going to yeah. be publishing more, you're going to be kind of uh, shopping for more all the time. Yeah, well, I, I got a laundry list of things, but uh, I got, once I get to it, yeah, it's on the list to come up with some more of them. So, yeah. Uh, because again, there's so many, you know, sales, good sales books out there, right? right. It's like, yeah. I mean, obviously you can contribute and add, you know, more, but then I think people don't read books as they wrote, right? When they kind of, again, when I discovered predictable revenue and then right. there was a know-how, there was a revolution. You just, everyone yeah. read it, right? But then there's so many good books out there right now, yeah. right? So many great experts. And then there are some fresh ideas, right? But yeah. you just don't have worth to read all of them these days. Yeah, right? that's so. that's why I'm not really a book reader. The reason is is because most books I've read, um, you know, they're eighty percent fluff with with twenty percent good stuff, and mm -hmm. so you know they tell five stories to make a point. And to me, that's why I'm I like more about blogs, and uh, I'm mm -hmm. much more of a snippet. Like you know, try it, apply it, try it, apply it, try it, yeah. apply it. Whereas a book, you know, I, you know, I'd almost rather read a book for pleasure. Than education because I just don't I don't find them rewarding and it's like I read I spend and I'm also not exactly a fast reader so you know I spend hours reading a book to get one concept out of it that makes me think a little bit yeah. differently it's like okay could you just give me that one concept then I could have gone my merry way right uh, but everybody feels like they have to you know fill it with eighty percent fluff so that they can get it to two hundred pages so they can charge uh -huh. their twenty four ninety nine for it right because yeah. nobody's going to pay twenty four ninety nine for a couple of paragraphs of a right. <laughs> of a book so yeah. I mean I personally would but yeah. you know that's that's not the mass. Well, I I feel like I mean again I don't know you but I feel like you are in a way perfectionist in a way so you would if there will be a book that you would want that book to be very good so you would spend a lot of time and efforts kind yeah. of polishing it and if that is the case and then you would not spend that time on something else that is yeah. more successful for you right now. And and then you were, as, as, I, as I just learned that you were efficient with your time right. and with things you are, so you wanted the book to be efficient, right? Yeah. So in this way, it's, and it's harder, right? Because you can right. write a good book with like 200, 300 pages, uh, all of that efficient, right? Yeah. You need a lot of frameworks and all yeah. that. So it's tough. Hey, talking about you, um, who are your main competitors in this space? Who do you consider to be your competitors? Ah, you know, it's a funny question because I've, I've given up on competition a long time ago. Um, I, you know, I, I'll name a few, but you know, my real mentality is: you ever read the book? Um, and this is one I have read, but it's it's uh, it, it's sorry, the infinite, yeah, the infinite game by Simon Sinek, by Simon Sinek. Yeah, so it's the infinite game, and Simon Sinek's mm -hmm. the one who start came up with you know the book on the why, like understand your why, right? Mm -hmm. And the infinite game is an interesting one to me because it talks about how there's two types of games, right? There's the finite game and then the infinite game, and the finite game is is there's a there's a beginning and an end, there's a winner and a loser, right? Right. And most people play the finite game because they look at their competition and say, I want to beat my competition. Mm -hmm. Um, I've never, you know, I was, I, I was focused on my competition for early in my career, but what I realized was that I was so consumed with trying to beat my competition and sell against my competition uh -huh. that I stopped focusing on selling to the clients. And mm -hmm. so I, you know, I, I'd, I'd be more worried about beating them than, than actually servicing the client. And so I stopped thinking about it a long time ago and I don't really look at competition because to me, you know, Look, there's a million sales consultants out there. There's a million sales methodologies. I mean, just na name a methodology in there, quote unquote, my competition, Sandler, Miller, Hyman, Taz, Spin, you name it. Richard mm -hmm. Harris, uh, Jim Keenan, uh, you know, uh, Scott Lease. Like these are all people who are, quote unquote, under the umbrella of competition for me. Mm -hmm. But they're really not because they don't do exactly what I do. Right. I, I mean, mm -hmm. there are certain components of what each of us does that's really, really good. And there's other stuff that's not so good. And so for me, I, I, it's either if I lose an account, it's because either I'm not the, a right, the right fit, quite frankly, right. or I didn't do a good enough job as a sales rep. So the, yeah, I got to get better. And so, you know, but, but if you look at it, you know, those methodologies and some of those people I would consider, consider direct competitors of mine. You know, I think if you were to look at the very direct competitors, it would probably be Richard Harris, even though he's a good friend of mine. Uh, Jim Keenan, again, he's a good friend of mine. Uh, yeah. Winning by Design is a, is a good group. I've heard, uh, you know, some of their stuff is really good. Um, you know, the, the, so those are the ones that, that, that I see out there. Um, but I'm rarely in a competitive situation uh, mm. in a lot of times. I, I'm, I'm more competing about the need for the client and if it's the right fit. Mm -hmm. um, 
you are, you know, you are, of course are the big name in the in the space. And uh, right. uh, I I saw the I saw the interview that uh, you had with uh, this guy Brandon uh, Bornansin. Yeah, Bornansin. Yeah, yeah, Brandon, yeah. yeah. and. Uh, one of the first questions you ask him, and I, I picked up on that question, and I was like, yeah. okay, are you guys going to be expanding on that or, or, or not? And I didn't yeah. get the clear answer. So, you know, kind of, can you educate me on, you know, where you stand compared to other sales philosophies and maybe the names that you mentioned, like yeah. Brand, Balfour, Gary Vee, and, yeah. and others? So I personally, and look, you know, I, I don't know these people, um, so I, I can't judge their character. Um, but my opinion is, is that the Grant Cardone's and the Wolf of Wall Street's Jordan Belfort's of the world, uh, it's everything that's wrong about selling in my opinion, because it's all about, it's all about us. It's all about making as much money as you can. It's all about stuffing it down the client's throat. It's about using sneaky tactics to, you know, lock them into not, do you know what I mean? It, it, it's, mm -hmm. it's really, and, and it's, and look, it's, I think it's, it still makes me cringe, but it's much more appropriate for the B2C world, right? Mm -hmm. If you're selling cars, if you're selling insurance, if you're selling real estate, okay, some of that stuff matters. You know what I mean? And, and, and I'm not saying all of their stuff is terrible, but I'm just saying the way it's applied in a lot of ways is terrible because it's mostly, if you think of, it's the same reason I hate most of the quote unquote sales movies out there. Like you hear, you know, when people say, hey, John, what are your favorite sales movies? And you hear people say, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, Wolf of Wall Street, Boiler Room. Like to me, those are the worst sales movies I've ever seen. Now they're great movies. Don't get me wrong; they're super entertaining movies. Um, but sales movies—they're horrible because it's it's everything that's wrong about selling. It's about convincing people. And and quite frankly, if I think if I think if you're trying to convince someone in sales, I think you're doing it wrong, yeah. right? Sales ultimately is about helping people solve problems or achieve goals, right? And if your problems aren't big enough, your goals aren't big enough, then why are we having this conversation? And so. If I have to convince you of something, then I think I'm doing it wrong. And a lot of what their tactics are about are about mm -hmm. convincing somebody that this is the right solution, even when it might not be. And don't get me wrong, I, do, I don't think I do believe that not all clients know what is best for them. Not, not all clients know right. what they need. And so I do think there is some diagnosis and some ability to kind of influence people, but not manipulate people. And I think that's the line is that if you're trying to influence somebody to get them to look at things from a different perspective, then I'm all in. But if you're trying to manipulate them to get something done, then I, I think you're just a douchebag sales rep. And unfortunately, what I've seen from mm -hmm. a lot of those, from those two people specifically, is comes down to kind of sleazy tactics that convince people to do things that they might not want to do otherwise. And so that's why I, I, I really have a hard time with those professions because you know there are those those individuals and what they teach because they are speaking to a much larger a larger audience i mean for me right. i've been very methodical and always been rather annoyed that the fact that you know i'm not 10x you know the 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 size that i am right now or 100x right because both of them are 100x me by far right which means you could look at it one way to say they're far more popular or you could look at it the other way and just say they got a much louder voice and are willing to to uh, walk that gray line, if not cross it more often than not to get mm -hmm. people to pay attention to them. So, mm -hmm. you know, very often good stuff is very complex stuff is for people that either understand or appreciate or sort of like see the context and some blunt or very basic things are very viable, right? So yeah. if we see like, uh, you know, videos on Instagram with cats and dogs, right? Like you can, mm -hmm. you know, you can work on a great production, very thoughtful or like, yeah. When you have a Marvel movie, right? Like you can have a Marvel movie, or you can have a a Cannes Cannes festival movie that just right. takes, you know, like you are not making money with, uh, you know, with some art house movies that get you thinking, right? Well, and but, I think that leads to our society too, in the sense that everybody's looking for the shortcut, right? Everybody's right. looking for the easy, you know, the silver bullet, the perfect thing to mm -hmm. say, the perfect template that's going to make it rain, and they'll make millions, mm -hmm. and that just doesn't exist. And I yeah. wish people would stop thinking that it did. So I don't know. I mean, I still get caught on it. Not going to lie. I, st I still get caught on like, you know, in Instagram when I see the, you know, this new, you know, nutrient that's going to help me lose weight or lower my blood pressure or whatever it is. And I'm looking at mm -hmm. it. I'm like, oh man, you know, they're pretty convincing. Like, let me try that. And then I inevitably try it and it's a waste of money. And I go back and wonder why the hell I did it. But again, it's, you're convincing me because of your slick marketing approach. And, and even though I pay attention to it, right. And shit, some of this stuff works. So. I'm not going to hate on at all, 
I just hate where it comes from. I hate the the ethos behind it and the, and the why behind it because it's not it's not customer centric. It's 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 selfish centric. It's me yeah. centric, which I don't think sales is, should be about. One last question on this topic, on this block, um, just to kind of confirm this, uh, because I, I, again, wanted to hear a few thoughts from you. So why do salespeople get no respect? <laughs> uh, I think it's deservedly so. I, I, I've actually tried to, it's almost a chicken and the egg question, right? Where you ask yourself, like, who lied to who first? Did the sales rep lie to the customer first or the customer lie to the sales rep first? And I don't know. That's kind of a, that's a religious question in a lot of ways. Like, was it the Big Bang Theory or was it God that created yeah. the universe, right? I don't know. But I think with the sales reps, look, it's, there's, a, there's a really good reason that people don't trust sales reps. And, and it is because of the convincing and how this industry has been portrayed in a lot of ways in the movies and everything else, but also how people have had the experience. Because, and I don't think it's necessarily a sales rep's fault. I think it's just going back to, let's go back to the first part of the conversation where we talked about the education system. Let's put it this way. You have a relatively ethical person, okay? Let's take, you know, Sarah. She's super ethical, a good person. And she's in college and she's doing a good job, right? And then she gets and she realizes her degree doesn't work, right? So I got to get into sales. Now, you give this sales professional, Sarah, a territory and a quota and limited training. And you say, all right, Sarah, and this is how most sales reps get into sales. It's like, okay, here's right. your territory, here's your quota, good luck, right? And here's a couple of scripts, whatever it is. And you tell Sarah that, hey, if you don't hit your numbers here, if you don't get revenue and whatever it else, not only are you not going to get paid, so you can't pay your bills, but you're probably going to get fired in, you know, three months, four months, whatever it is, right? So you put somebody who's a rather ethical, good person into that situation, and they're going to do some slightly unethical things. They're going to start to find that gray line of what's going to justify to them why they should be doing so, especially if they have a bad boss or a bad environment that they're in, right? Then they go the Grant Cardone right. track or something like that. So now you take a good person and you turn them into a sleazy sales rep because they have mm -hmm. to get paid. They have to make their commission checks. And so they, they take the shortcuts. They say things that probably aren't true. They overpromise and underdeliver, right? And so it's, it's, I think it's an education uh, problem because if we were to educate people as a profession, like every other profession there is out there, mm -hmm. and we treated it as either, you know, um, a trade, you know, like people go and learn how to be a plumber or they learn how to be an electrician. Like you learn how to be a sales rep. If you either do that or you integrate it into the universities and make it a, ma a minor for almost everybody, right? Or at mm -hmm. least a, an elective course that they have to take or whatever, right? Um, now all of a sudden you, you educate on the right ways and the right approach, and then you put them out into the real world and they sell quote unquote the right way. And if we reduce the grow at all cost mentality that we've had over the past 10 years in SaaS yes. and VCs just stuffing money into companies and saying, it doesn't matter, go. Like if we can just ratchet back a little bit on the grow at all cost approach and we can educate yeah. now, all of a sudden you're going to start to see this profession elevate. But we're in a position that we're in. We, I mean, we're, yeah. we're we're slightly more trusted than lawyers and politicians. I mean, and it's not really that much. I mean, if you look at the overall uh, surveys, <laughs> I think it's like politicians are at least here in the states. Politicians are you know at the bottom, and then there's lawyers slightly above them, and then there's yeah. sales reps slightly above them, and that's a that's not good company right there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I wanted to also uh, comment that. As you just said, like there's so many VCs that were pondering money on and pouring money on on the businesses. So now every SE when they apply for the job, they have certain expectation of the income, yep. six figure salary, all the tools, all the support they get. So yep. in a way, like for, for this to business to work, you actually need them closing because if After. they're not closing, it's like there's nothing work for you, right? So all, for me, as I we're we're bootstrapping our businesses, mm -hmm. right? Like when I'm interviewing and getting a new SE on, 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 and sending the offer, I always kind of trying to give them the best deal I could, mm -hmm. but the expectations are so high that sort of like if they fail, right, it's going to be tough on the business. So although you give all the support that you can, you either they make this work so you can they make this work for them, or if that not, doesn't work for them, they cannot make an offer where you say, and you say, hey, you know, here is like, you know, 70 grand or 60 grand base or whatever. Here is like a 20, 30 base thousand commission or something. They want it like, hey, SC starts at 120, right? And then you need to get tools on top of that. You need to get yeah. the support, you need to get the paydays, all of those things. And you're like, 
Yeah. So if you cannot actually sell for $1 million, uh, you know, a year, like with my product, so we have a problem here, right? Yeah. So, and then, hey, I'm going to go and I work for whatever, HubSpot or yeah. Okta or whatever, someone yeah. else is paying me that, right? And you're like, yeah, but those guys are not making the actual money. They're getting the investor's money. So they right. work, they're, they're playing the growth game, right? Which is totally. kind of, it's not a very happy to be place to be at, right? In no. sales when it's happening. So. Huh. No, and and I think that's again. I think you're spot on with the with the expectation. Like w- with what happened over the past ten years, you got you got like you know twenty two year old kids coming out of college expecting to get paid eighty ninety thousand dollar base salary with a hundred and fifty all in to make cold call. Not to I'm I'm sorry to not even make cold calls to push yeah. buttons on an email yeah. thing. Like, are you yeah. out of your f- mind? Yeah, that you're going to get paid that much. Mm-hmm. And that's why if you just look at the economics of all this stuff, like I, I hate to say it because my life is sales and, 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 I, and I bleed this profession, but if you were to get the sales commissions and salaries out of the product cost, most of these products would be half as expensive, mm-hmm. right? They'd be far more affordable yeah. for organizations to invest in. So, you know, but if you think of sales, and again, this is why I think we're moving in this direction. If you, th- if you think of sales as a function to a certain degree of marketing, right? Especially on the front end where everything's a touch point, right? And it's all mm-hmm. value touch points to get somebody to have a conversation with you. Well, now you can start to justify having sales reps do all that front end activity mm-hmm. or at least augment that front end activity. But to your point, if they're not closing, then what's the point, right? Because a lot of times you, you have the, the managers closing, the executive closing, right? And if you really mapped out the true cost of sale for most of these organizations, it would be, ridiculous and, and, and you would have to hold on to these customers for three four five six years for that customer to be ultimately profitable for that business and i think hopefully this this shakeup that we've all you know kind of experienced in the past six months is getting everybody to realize you know hey profitable growth maybe is back in vogue right now you know what i mean instead of just grow yeah. at all costs that we can grow in a methodical way from a profitable standpoint but who knows? It'll come back around and the cycle will change again. Once interest rates drop yeah. down to 2% again, money will be flowing for free and it'll be back on, you know, going crazy again. But, you know, we'll see. Well, I, again, I think for my business, maybe for yours as well, fingers crossed when this is going to happen again, right? Yeah. Because, yeah, uh, you I'm know, sure. at the end of the day, you like to play the the profitability game and sort of like, let's tie the bells and let's be yep. very conscious. But you really want it not to make the mistake because right now the cost of the mistakes is very high. Huge. Right. And that's why I was like, yeah, I don't, don't like that. So there's a quote that uh, I, I saw one of your articles, I think you said, I don't have much of a filter and I don't <laughs> like politics. So yeah. that's kind of about you to summarize yeah. your personality, right? Yeah. Um, so the questions are, um, tell me more about your five year goal for retirement. Yeah. Why did you set it up? Yeah. I mean, it kind of came in this, it, 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 it's almost practicing what I preach to a certain degree. And, you know, the no filter is, is definitely something that's why I'm an entrepreneur, right? Because I can't, I, I don't, I can't play politics. I actually got fired from Staples, um, or offered another position because I couldn't keep my mouth shut within the corporation after they bought my first company. But you know, the, the five-year plan came to practice in a lot of what I preach. You know, I talk to people a lot where somebody, you know, reps will come and ask me, hey, John, you know, I'm in this company, I'm in this role right now, and I'm not exactly happy, and I'm thinking about making a switch, right? And as a matter of fact, somebody hit me up on Instagram with this exact question this morning, and I gave mm-hmm. them the exact advice that I always give, which is, you know, what's your five-year plan? Like, look, like, and I when I say that, you know, you think back to, I used to think back to the interviews that I used to go through when I was younger and, and you know, I always asked that five-year question, what do you want yeah. to be in five years? And I always used to think it was stupid, right? Because, oh, I want to be a manager and whatever. But now actually I think it's really important, but not from a business, not from like that company standpoint. It's where do you want to be in your life in five years, right? Mm-hmm. So if you can vision it, I mean, I'm big affirmations and, you know, positive, you know, visualization and all that other stuff. But if you can look out five years and say, this is the type of lifestyle that I want to be living, Okay. Then based on that lifestyle, like, okay, do you want a house? Do you want a kids? Do you want a wife? Do you want a you know, partner? Whatever it is. Right. Okay, well, based on that, now how much money do you need to make to be able to afford that lifestyle? Yep. And therefore, what kind of job do you need to have to be able to make that money? And then you back into it. Because I always say, look, I could eat a shit sandwich today, right? If I know that shit sandwich is going to get me to that next level, right? I mean, I will literally be, I will, I will wipe the floors. I will clean the bathroom. I will take out the trash if it's going to get me to that next level. Right. But if you don't have a plan, 
Well, then what happens is you just start going around looking for better tasting shit sandwiches, right? And they're all going to taste like shit, but one's going to be a little bit better than the other. But if you have a plan, you can say, okay, I'll, I'll deal with this. And it's a lot more tolerable for you to deal with it too, if you know you have a plan. And so for me, I, you know, I, my daughter's 12. And so she's got about five or six more years um, until she hits, you know, college. And my wife and I both have traveled quite a bit and we both are, you know, CEOs of our own little companies here. So we have the flexibility to do what we want um, and go where we want. And so my goal has always been to, you know, or is, is kind of solidified probably about two or three years ago. As a matter of fact, it, it popped into my head of saying, you know, hey, I want to, you know, I want to retire, quote unquote, even though retirement is a foreign term to me. I don't I, when I say right. retire, I mean work because I want to, not because I have to. That's my definition yeah. of retirement. And I wanted a nice little, you know, boutique hotel uh, with about five to 10 rooms, you know, 10, 10 little bungalows mm -hmm. and a place, you know, like Costa Rica or something like that, where my wife can and I can run it as a mm -hmm. bed and breakfast and all of our friends can come and hang. And we, I want it so that as long as you can come there, as long as you pay to get there, right? Like you, I'm not going to pay for you to get there, but once you're there, right. everything's taken care of, right? So food, booze, you stay as long as you want. You don't have to pay any money because my wife and I are, are entertainers. We throw a lot of parties and you know, a lot of our friends don't have a ton of money, right? So they have, they're they contractors or whatever. So we tend to throw a big party to have everybody have a good time. And so I'd like to kind of exp expand on that and, you know, keep the fun going, if you will. But it also puts me in a position where, you know, we could run at an executive treat, an executive retreat center or whatever it is. So we can make money doing it, but it's, you know, we're, we're actively kind of mapping out our plans to, to get out of here too. You know, I mean, I love Boston. I love Massachusetts. Um, I grew up here. Uh, it's it's where I'm from. It's where I'll always be from. But, you know, the winters get a little rough. Um, and quite frankly, a lot right. of the stuff that is happening in the pol political world, especially yeah. in the United States, is really not making us feel very comfortable in any way, shape or form. And so, uh, you know, I want to kind of kick back after a little while and, and enjoy ourselves, but do it yeah. in a way that is actually uh, similar to how I'm running things right now. Costa Rica is nice. Plus, I mean, again, you need less stress in your life, right? Yeah. You wanted to get to the point where it's all about the everyday joy, right? And yeah, that exactly. sounds like a great place. I have a few um, friends that went, uh, that moved from Philly to uh, to Argentina and they're very yeah. happy about oh, the, the whole yeah. scene in Argentina. So, yeah. Yeah, hey, um, like Buenos Aires, Argentina, like that whole yeah. thing down there is, uh, it, you know, it's a different lifestyle too. Yeah, you know what I mean? breakfast is actually a great idea. I thought about the winery. I always wanted to have my own kind of winery and yeah. just the place where I can kind of, you know, get old somewhere in like mm -hmm. Italy-ish yeah. or somewhere in Austria. Italy's but, on the list. Bed and breakfast and winery is actually sounds even there better, right? Because we can get people on and then you can be a very good host and then yeah. make some money off that, right? Yep. And be one of exactly. the best. I know there's a place in Italy. It's a it's a small kind of winery. Um, uh, there was uh, like a Italian and Canadian like family moved in there and this is one of the best magical places that I've been to because what they did, they they bought this old stone house, mm -hmm. like, and they rebuilt it a bit and they added some, you know, like benches and chairs with the wood, mm -hmm. with some doggies and there's a very nice valley and the sun yeah. goes down and you drink wine and eat bread with them and they talk with you. It's it's just amazing place right. to be at and you absolutely want to spend every day of your life there, right? Yeah, and exactly. Uh, you know, Obviously, Boston is great, but then you, do you want to do that or be in Boston every day of your life? Yeah, right? so I'll take Boston in the summer. Boston. I'll take Boston in the summer. But man, yeah, if I could summer. get out of here, if I could mm -hmm. get out, if I could play the way I want to, I could, if I could mm -hmm. get out of here, you know, January 1st and come back, right. you know, maybe June 1st, you know, and do the snowbird thing. I think that's where uh, I, I would love it. I, you know, I'd love yeah. to keep our place here in Boston and all of our connections and family and everything else. Right. But uh, as far yeah, as living wise, I think I need to kick it down a notch uh, after sure. after the insanity. I, I got a few more years in me, though. I, I can go pretty hard for another four or five years here, so. Uh, the first value on your list is family first. Uh, can you tell me how did this translate into your lifestyle and work? Yeah. Yeah, this is an interesting story. It was a little bit of a revelation for me because I, um, you know, so back in early 2021, my dad passed away and it kind of ripped me out of the business and threw me on a little bit of a loop to try to figure out, okay, what's next for me, right? And one of the things was um, I, I knew I needed to recenter all my why and my values. Yeah. And so I got my business coach and we went through the why and the values exercise. And I've always been a very value-driven person, right? 
And I had them, you know, I had 12 personal guidelines to success, which, you know, kind of translate, I thought translated into my values, but I had never really sat down and, and really thought through what my core values were, even though I thought I knew them. And the way the exercise works for anybody who hasn't been through it is, you know, you go, you, there's about, you know, 50 or a hundred words on a piece of paper that are all different values. Right. And you kind of figure out the 20 that are most relevant to you. And then you figure out the five and then you prioritize those five, right? Whatever. And I remember when I got down to the five and family was on the list. And then when it came to prioritizing, I had asked my um, business coach, I was like, well, isn't family kind of just always number one? Like, isn't it just inherently right. number one? Is And he looked at me and he goes, no, absolutely not. He goes, if you want family to be your number one value, you have to write it down and you have to live it. You have to literally ask yourself every time you're making a decision, how is this going to impact my family? Mm. And so, and, and when he said it to me like that, I was like, shit. Because I had been traveling up until that point, up until COVID hit, you mm. know, my, again, my daughter's 12, so COVID, she was 10. Um, her entire life, I'd been traveling. I, I mean, I'm 2 million miles in less than 10 years. And I was a weekend dad, you know what I mean? And I was desperately trying to get off of an airplane, but I, I was doing a terrible job at it. And I, but, but I always was saying that, oh, the reason I'm doing this is for family. It's for you, right? <clears throat> right? It's for, oh, so my wife can have, you mm. know, my daughter can have the opportunities, the you know, schools, right. stuff, whatever, right? All the resources, everything else. And when, when we went through the exercise and reprioritizing, he said, you have to think about it on every, it, it hit me like a ton of bricks that I wasn't doing all that for my family. I was telling myself that I was doing it and I was making, and it was making, it was helping me justify why I was doing it. But the reason I was flying all over the world and doing what I was doing quite simply was because I was really f good at it. You know what I mean? And there was just something about being the guy, you know what I mean? To stand in front of a thousand people and give a presentation and have everybody say, oh, that was awesome. You know, or to, I mean, I, I would, I would fly to Singapore for a day. I would fly to India for a day. I would fly, you know, and it's just as it's ridiculous as it sounds, it's kind of cool to tell, to tell your friends, hey, yeah, right. I was in Singapore just just yesterday, right? And they're like, holy shit. And so it was more of an ego thing for me. And, yeah. and when I realized that I was doing it for me and not my family, I, it, it, it hurt. Um, uh, I had to come to grips with it. Didn't exactly tell my wife, you know, when I realized it, because I was a little, I don't want to say ashamed, but I was, right. I was a little like, mm. And then, you know, and, and when I reset it now, absolutely. You know, the first question I ask myself is, okay, how's this going to impact my family? And if there's ever a choice uh, of doing something family or work oriented um, that matters, obviously, then mm -hmm. I, I make the choice on family every time. Like I've canceled more meetings now than I've, you know, in the past two years, I've canceled more meetings with clients or more trainings with clients than I ever have in my entire life because of family, right? Because I wanted to be there for my daughter's recital, because I wanted to be there, uh, have to go pick her up at school, you know, those type of things, because I wanted to be with my wife and go out on a date night with her and not stay an extra hour so I could, you know, get that extra few bucks from the client. Like it's, it matters. I know there's people that, um, you know, that choose the different path, right? You just, as you just said, you just need to be honest with yourself, right? Yeah. You're not doing that for your family. You're doing that for yourself. And yeah. if you wanted to prioritize yourself and that excitement that you get or that dopamine that you get from yeah. sort of like making a sale or something, that's, that's fine, right? That's yeah. nothing wrong about that. No, there's that. nothing wrong just with it. being honest about that, right? And it's exactly. And it's also, that, and they don't always have to be in that order. You know what I mean? Like, quite frankly, sometimes you do have to put yourself first. Sometimes you do have to focus on you so that you can get to a point where you can focus on the other stuff, right? right? So you, I think it's something, I don't think a core value ever changes, but mm -hmm. I think the focus and prioritization of those core values can absolutely uh, change and it should. One of your videos, you said that you had an advice to your, to your young version of yourself to pay more attention. Mm. And I was wondering, uh, what is paying attention to your present self is? Yeah, so I think this is about the, the, that was more in relationship to what was what was happening around me, right? So I think a lot of us just go through the motions in a lot of ways. We do our job, we do what we're told to do, and we excel and we do things, but we don't pay attention to what's happening around us. So for instance, when your boss rolls out a new comp plan, right? And it's new commission plan and you gotta figure it out, right? Most of the times it's, it's not good. Most people are annoyed with it, right? And it's like, oh shit, right? But what I always used to do, be like, all right, whatever. Let me grab this comp plan. Let me figure out how to maximize it. And let me yeah. go figure out how to make my money. Yeah. See you later, right? And I, what I didn't pay attention to was how they rolled it out, how they you know, integrated it, what the messaging right. was, how people reacted, how they handled the frustration of it, right? right? 
And those are all things that if you actually pay attention to are going to bear fruit later on in your career. Because then when right. you become a leader, hopefully, if that's your track, you can remember, ooh, I remember how they did that. Mm -hmm. I remember how that made me feel. And I don't want to do that again, you know? And so I, I, you know, I would learn through a lot of them osmosis and I do remember stuff, but I wasn't intentional at paying attention to how business was yeah. run. Like you're talking about your startup right now, right? If I'm a sales rep, right? I, I remember um, when I, after I sold my first company and I worked for mm -hmm. this small little startup, Basho, which is the training that I, I now deliver um, or kind of stem from. I remember vividly that Jeff Hoffman, right? Um, I was a sponge when I walked in there. I mean, I, you know, and I had already been a CEO or I'm sorry, VP of sales and sold my company to Staple, but I was just mm -hmm. like, okay, cool. I, I Here's a startup, another startup, and it's a different field. So I remember him walking around being like, yeah, we're about to have a brainstorming session. Don't get in my way. Don't get my way. I got brainstorm. I've got to get my brainstorm mind on. And they were brainstorming about marketing ideas. And I'm, you know, I was a, oops, I was a trainer, so I had nothing to do in, in right. that world of marketing. But I said, hey, you mind if I just sit in on this? And he was like, mm -hmm. Why? I'm like, I, I just want to understand how you guys are positioning this, how, like what the flow is. I want to learn uh, how this is because it's going to mm -hmm. impact me. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. So I just right. sat in the fly on the wall and paid attention. And so I think a lot of that has to do with, you know, think about mm -hmm. the one on ones that you have with your manager and how your manager engages you. Remember what it feels like to be supported and remember what it feels like not to be supported. Right. And, and, and almost keep a journal from a business standpoint. Yeah to say learning lessons, right? So that later on you can reflect back and say, mm, yep, now it's my turn. Now it's my turn to build a team. Now it's my turn to roll out a comp plan. Now it's my turn to do a marketing campaign. What can I learn from that? And, and really from the bottom up, like how it made me feel, how, how it was integrated and whether it was successful or not. I mean, a lot of that stuff can help you skip a few steps. Oh and yeah. I've always just done, unfortunately, things the hard way, right? I, yeah. I'm, I always, I know that you can learn from history. I know that you should learn from history, but I'm much more of a doer than I am. That's why I don't right. like reading books. I'd rather go make the mistake myself. Quick, but, yeah. you know, there's been a few books recently that I've read that have gotten my eyes open to be like, Jesus, man, if I had just read this book before, I, and th there's one that I'm, I'll, I'll bring up right now, which is um, uh, the E-Myth Revisited. So there was the E-Myth, right? Yeah. And then the E-Myth Revisited. And I remember yeah. reading the E-Myth a long time ago and I totally got the concept, but then mm -hmm. I read E-Myth Revisited. And literally what they mapped out as far as what a small business does and a, you know, a tactician yeah. and blah, 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 and then grows and then scales back, that legitimately just happened to me. Like almost word for word what happened. What right. how, And they even said in the book, this is more predictable than the sun coming up in the morning. And I was like, son of a You know, but... But on the yeah. other hand, I don't, because of the way my brain works, I don't think even if I had read that message that I would have really applied it because I'm pretty stubborn and I'm like, I'm going to do it my way, right? But I wish I was a little bit more open to other perspectives. Mm -hmm. And I think I am, but a lot of times I'm just like, it, I'm going to figure this out myself and I'm going to make the mistakes mm -hmm. and I'm going to learn from them. So I've made a ton right. of mistakes in my life and I've learned from a lot of them, but I think I probably should do a much better job at learning from other people who have made similar mistakes and who are a lot smarter than me. That's so true. I mean, I think that uh, paying attention and being able to have access to information and to kind of being able to work with great people and see the organization transforming and things happening is equal to having a kind of a good comp structure. No. So in a way, like it give you a better lift, you know, long term, oh, yeah. right? And you know, I just, uh, on the weekend, I was uh, discussing with my friend, uh, you know, the, the, the scenario where there's a sales leader who doesn't have the, the, the skill set enough to a certain level where the company is. And that person has two ways of dealing with this. The first one, step down, say, hey, I don't have the right skill set, hire mm -hmm. someone, I'm going to, you know, take off some of that comp on there, but then I wanted to be working under a person who knows how to do that so I can pay attention, get those signals so I can level up myself, yeah. right? Or the other way, hey, I am not right fit for this organization. I will go to another organization. Right. Well, I'll do whatever I learned in that organization from the scratch. Yeah. So in a way, both scenarios are good for that sales leader, right? But then the first one would actually help you to streamline your career faster, right? Because you can learn and pay attention, right? Yeah. But then you need to have the skill of consciously paying attention. And then with another yeah. one, it give you more ego, more comfortability with regards to, hey, you know, I know how to do that. I will teach right. someone else how to do that, right? So we yeah. there are two types of people. So I wanted to get 
you know, 10x value in in the next five, 10 years rather mm-hmm. than getting something right now. So right. I wanted to 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 work under the leadership of the people who can actually teach me that, right? Yeah. And then paying that attention. Because as you are, you know, as you're building a business, you always pay attention to everything, right? Like yeah, you probably absolutely. know all the metric, everything. Yep. But if, if you're in a job, you never pay attention because it's mm-hmm. not something you were paid for, right? Nope. Like why do I need to know what marketing is doing if I'm in sales, right? right. But figuring out how the market marketing works actually can help you a lot into your journey, right? So totally. absolutely. And I huh. the only challenge that I've found, because I I've done that before. I've I've actually self-selected as a VP, you know, for my first startup, for instance, and said, mm-hmm. guys, you know, I'm 23 years old. I have no mm-hmm. idea what I'm doing mm-hmm. here. You know, why don't we hire somebody who's been there, done that, and I'll learn right. from them, right? Yeah. And man, I you, you just gotta make sure that hire is the right hire. Right. Yeah, because I, we've hired, I can't tell you how many times I've had self limiting beliefs of myself and my abilities mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. I've just never done it before. And we've hired somebody who's quote unquote been there, done that. And they're a disaster. You know what I mean? Like they're, yeah. they're the, they're the, they sit back and they bring their, you know, their oh, previous yeah. account list, their previous manual, and they just implement it. And it's like, whoa, 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 wait a minute here. None of that makes sense in this environment. You're just cookie cuttering your thing here. You're not actually learning and, and helping. And so I think it's, it's, I agree. If I could find the right leader to get me yeah. to, to work with, then yes. But I will give a tip to everybody listening to this right now. Be very careful if you're in an organization and you are the VP of anything that got the company to a certain level. And then the company hires an SVP of that thing. That's effectively corporate's way of firing you. That's corporate's way of firing you because what they do is they say, oh, you know, You'll do probably everything, especially in a startup. You'll do everything mm-hmm. up until a point with limited resources, limited, you know, all this other stuff, limited budget, and you'll scrape and claw your way through. And then they'll finally get to the point where it's like, yeah, now we got to take this seriously. So they'll go hire somebody, pay them a shitload of money, give them a ton of resources, give them all the money, you know, budget. And then your job is going to help transfer your knowledge to that person. And then when they have that knowledge, they're going to take all the credit for everything that was done and you're going to get pissed. And you're going to end up going to find another job. So it's actually a way of self-select, of getting you to self-select out because your job is you're, you're going to look at all the benefits that they got and all the credit they're getting, and you're going to be pissed, yeah. and you're going to want to go do something else. So they that win. That felt like a personal us. story to you. That felt it, like you've it, been there, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but happened. then, uh, like another perspective is that sometimes you're looking for a person who have a fresh perspective of things. It's just because when you are a company in grown sort of like professional we've been with the organization for four years and you know how to do things right you just the way you you do things like for example when i am as a founder struggling with something like hey those are building the marketing right i can get it to a certain point with my you know grind and skill set and something but at some mm-hmm. point i need someone that done that already yeah. like a good person who can lead and build structure yep. and when I find that person, what I am doing, I'm just assigning the person to the role, stepping down, do something yep. else, right? Yep. I think that the great teams, and from my conversation, um, I, you know, uh, with without, I just spoke with with Chris Orlo from, mm-hmm. you know, from the Gong. Yep. It's like you can transfer to different roles. So it doesn't mean that you need to leave the organization as the VP of something. Go right. and do something else, right? Sometimes you just need someone else, like a fresh from the outside right. that can kind of you know, help you to open up eyes for some things that you didn't do that. But then it doesn't matter. It doesn't mean that you lose your authority into things. So you still the same person that build that. It's just sometimes you're not focusing on that on a daily basis. Do something else. It's not about the ego, right? Very often, one of the things that founders are doing, we don't have ego. So it means that if you are great in marketing, please get the job done, right? Go for it. I don't want to do that never. You will not see me ever doing that, right? And very often in the corporate world, when you have VP of something, they are still so kind of tiding for the job. They don't see that sometimes you need to let it go, do something else, be useful, make yeah. money, but then learn from from others because it's not about you. It's about getting the kind of job done at the end of the day, right? Yeah, well, what you just described is different, right? So you're t- coming at it from a leadership and a founder standpoint. And absolutely, I couldn't agree more. Identify what the need is, go find somebody who's really competent and, and you know create the vision for it and then hand it off. And absolutely, right? What I'm talking about is you're part of an organization. You get hired early as this role. You grow right. up. And then they, they, the organization hires somebody on top of you. That's the, the corporate way of firing. But I couldn't agree mm-hmm. with you more as far as you. Ide- Look, as a, I think in any role, what you should always be looking to do is find your replacement. 
right? Like because yeah. if you're looking to grow, then you're going to need somebody to so take true. over. And the best, so uh, true. Dick, you know, in my opinion, one of the one of the great characteristics of a leader is to to actually find their replacement and find yeah. a better replacement mm-hmm. than they were mm-hmm. in that role, so that they can go on and move on to do something else. So I think all of us should be looking like if you're even if you're uh, an SDR. You should be thinking about how can I work with another SDR, a brand new SDR, to basically take over my role in mm-hmm. my territory and do it better than me so I can ultimately mm-hmm. be an AE. If you're an AE, then you, how can I be a great AE so I can be a manager, right? Mm-hmm. Whatever it is, figure out how to replace yourself. There is this concept of kind of ambition where founders have very high threshold of ambition. Mm-hmm. And because of that, we, we it's not enough for us. So you can, you know, build a business for a million dollars, then you want a 10 million, yep. then you want 25, then Always. 50 and 100. Yep. And you just kind of you grow it because you see the vision. Oh, it actually, we can grow there, right? Mm-hmm. Whereas very often what I've seen, especially when you get to a certain level of seniority, like a manager, you have a certain kind of comfort level that you don't want to shake, right? right? So it's like, so that's why you don't see things, you cannot just shop things because you're in your own comfort zone. So mm-hmm. let me give you an example. Like when I'm a head of sales and I'm running a sales team or head of marketing and I have a certain KPI or targets to be met and I'm meeting those targets, right? Okay. And if you know that for business, you need to disrupt that and you need to oh. get to 125% because you know you cannot, let's say, acquire a lead for $500 in a recession. You need right. to at a 400 because yep. the buying changes. So when you approach this sort of head of sales or head mm-hmm. of marketing, the first reaction would be, there's no way we can do that, right? right? Because like, th- because they process all the experiences they had right. building that so far yep. and they know that it's so tight yep. that they don't see that. And they guys, work with me here. And then you explain the whole reasoning of things and say, yeah, I don't know. So then they start working with you and they start thinking out. Whereas mm-hmm. you have someone from the fresh perspective that comes in and say, hey, it can be done. Yep. And I have an energy and motivation to get that done. Mm-hmm. So the idea of the, I think the great future leaders are, to be able to step down from thing and say, hey, I will collaborate with that person. I'll do something else mm-hmm. because I see that there's kind of value into that, right? And not kind of pushing your ego. That Well, there's, what you just described makes total sense. Yeah. And I'm sure that there's so many people feeling like that. Mm-hmm. But my, my point here is that very often from the business standpoint, it's not as simple as changing someone or getting no. someone, God, you know, kind of, I right? It so was. it's it's a more complex, yeah, right? Yeah, I really wish it was. <laughs> hey, a few, a few just closing points here. Sure. Um, you mentioned continuous improvement mentality. I was wondering how to implement this in your day-to-day life, not necessarily like talking about what is continuous improvement, but sure. how you actually do that with, with, with your day-to-day. Yeah, I think it's about picking something every day to, to I mean, ultimately, uh, you know, I've heard Kobe Bryant speak on this quite a bit. It's like, you want to look at, you know, at the end of the day, you want to be able to look at yourself in the mirror and say, am I better today than I was yesterday? Right. And and look, that can be the most minor thing. And in and, and a lot of days, it, you're, the answer is absolutely not. You know what I mean? Like a lot of days I look at myself, I'm like, nope, I am not better today than I was yesterday. So I just got to be better tomorrow. And when I say this, it's, you know, can you do one more push up today than you did yesterday? Can you make one more cold call today? Can you figure something out? Right. You would ask, you know, John, what am I, you know, if I could go tell my 22 year old self and one of the answers is pay attention. The other one is split test, A, B split test, everything you do. And I'll give you a quick example. Tactically, it's like, you know, if you make 50 dials in a day, right? Say, let's just do the cold call example here. Say you make 50 dials in a day and you get no meetings. That, to me, that's a terrible day, right? Because it's demoralizing and, and you didn't right. get anything. And you, and you probably didn't learn anything either because you were just hammering calls. But if you instead, uh, you know, grab a persona, for instance, and you come up with two different messages and you call the exact same persona with two separate messages and you make $25 with this approach and $25 with that approach and you still get no meetings. To me, that's actually not a bad day because you just learned something. Right. You just figured out two approaches that don't work. And then tomorrow you come and try a couple new ones. Mm-hmm. So that to me is this, it's the agile framework. It's a continuous improvement, but it's it's kind of picking something, anything, right? Um, that that you can point to and say, "Yep, in like I was better today. It, it, even just in that area, I was better today than I was yesterday in that area." And if you have that mentality, it, again, it's not about always improving. I think that's a, that's a misnomer. Like I've heard the one percent mentality a long time ago, and I'm like. You know, oh yeah, you know, you 50 days, you get 50% better than you were today. Like that's not the way it works. It's more of just the mentality of I'm just trying to be better today. And I'll and I relate this to um <clears throat> everything. I, you know, my number one 
advice to people getting married, for instance. My number one advice, and, and the reason I married my wife and, and, and chose my wife was because we weren't perfect. Mm -hmm. We weren't. We were getting better. And I could see us getting better mm -hmm. continuously, right? But my, and, and so my number one advice to people who are getting married, for instance, is make sure today, and I come up to them on their wedding day, and I say, make sure today is not the best day of your relationship, right? Because mm -hmm. so many people get married, right? So they get engaged, and then they have this huge, and then they have a beautiful wedding, and it's everybody's happy, and it's the best they've ever it felt and everything else. And then it actually goes downhill from there, right? Because they, they can never reach right. that peak yeah. of, of just happiness, that's if you big, will. Yeah. To me, I looked at it and I was like, yep, that's a, that's a step in our journey here. And, but tomorrow is actually going to be better today than today was because of this journey that we're on. And I think that's the mentality I take with personally, professionally, uh, personal development, relationships, and everything else. That's a good, good message to close up. Yeah. John, thank you so much for taking the time and spending this this time with me today. Um, I'm excited to release this final product. And um, yeah, it's been great. Thank you so much. I for appreciate answering it. All the questions. I have a, a bucket of, of others here in my list, but yeah. let's let's keep that for, for the part uh, part two. Part two. Right? Yeah, if, cool. if people are yeah. going to enjoy this. All right. Yeah. Awesome. And um, I do have an offer if you if you if you are open to it. I, I I got a few things. One on the book side of the house, and then the other side oh. uh, on the membership. Oh, if you're interested. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah of course. So anybody listen to this, uh, all you got to do is hit me up uh, on Instagram. It's John M as in Michael Barrows B A R R O W S. That's my handle. And if you just hit me up and tell me uh, you got a kid or you got something that that you think this book would be good for as a kid. Uh, just hit me up, give me your, um, just say, Hey, John, I heard you on this podcast and I would love to get one of those books for my kid and I'll send you, I'll have my, my daughter autograph one and send it over to you. You can actually check out the book and the details of it, uh, on the website. I want to be in sales when I grow up.com. I know it's a long one, but I want to be in sales when I grow up.com, put it on there. So that's the free offer. Also, if you just go to my website, jbarrows.com and go to the individual membership, uh, and put in code podcast. Uh, you get 25% off of my membership where I give all my training away, all the same stuff that com companies like Salesforce, LinkedIn, Box, and everybody else joins. So they get access to everything that I got, including live nice. trainings from me. So you just put podcast in the show notes and uh, they'll get 25% off. Awesome. Thank you so much, John. That's yeah. very valuable. And we're going to add some of those links in the description for people to have a quick access to those. So Perfect. I appreciate you yeah. giving the gifts. Or... Awesome. Hey, it's been great chatting with you and sitting down with you. Likewise.